So now that we've talked about factory methods, let's talk about completion stage methods. And I, I think you'll find two things that are relevant right off the top. First, there's, there's a lot of them. That's the bulk of the methods in the completable future API. And number two, they're really cool. So this is the best part of the completable future API, in my opinion. And we'll see that these completion stage methods are going to be used to chain together actions, or so-called dependent actions, that are called when previous asynchronous operations complete to work on their results, to process their results. And they're also used to compose things together in a simple way. So a completable future can serve as a completion stage for async result processing. And completion stage has a definitive meaning. And this is completion stage. Completion stage is an interface. And it's a stage of possibly asynchronous computation that performs an action or computes a value when another completion stage completes. That's the key thing. And what it's used to do is it's used to be able to allow dependent actions to run when previous asynchronous calls complete. And the dependent action then processes the results of the completed asynchronous operation. So let's take a look at an example. This is an example from the uh, EX8 folder in my GitHub repository. And what this is going to do is it's going to do some big fraction operations. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a non-reduced or an unreduced big fraction. So all that means is we're going to give it this big integer as its numerator, this big integer as its denominator, and we pass a false flag that says, don't reduce this fraction. We're going to reduce it in the background, because that could take a while. Then we're going to go ahead and define a supplier lambda called reduce, which, when called, is going to reduce the unreduced big fraction. So far, so good. Now we go ahead and we say completable future supply a sync, and we pass in the reduce supplier. So what that's going to do is that's going to put that supplier, it's going to arrange to have that supplier run in a background thread, in the worker thread, in the common fork join pool, as we just saw from the discussion of the internals of the factory method supply a sync. And supply a sync, as you recall, returns a completable future. And that completable future will be triggered when the asynchronous reduce operation finishes running asynchronously. And so what's going to happen when supply async finishes doing the reduction, this thing, then and only then will the then apply completion stage method be called back, which will take the result, which at that point will be a, a reduced big fraction, and it will convert that into a mixed fraction as a string. So it'll then apply that operation. We'll talk about then apply in just a bit. Then apply also returns a completable future. And when the conversion of the big fraction to the mixed string variant of the big fraction is done, that completable future will trigger. And the next dependent action in the completion stage pipeline will be invoked. So then we will accept the result, which will be a mixed string. And we will go ahead and print that mixed string using the fluent interface model, as we've talked about before. So you notice we, we can chain these things together. So the way to look at this is each of the methods here, supply async, then apply, then accept, registers a lambda action to apply. And the lambda action is called only after the previous stage completes successfully. So then apply is not called until supply async is done reducing the big fraction. Then when then apply is called, it's going to convert the result, which will be a big fraction, to a mixed string. And when that's done, then accept will go ahead and print the results out. So things only happen when everything else ahead of it completes successfully. So you can basically think of these actions that are passed as parameters to the completable future methods as being deferred 
until the previous stage completes and the appropriate thread is available to perform the operation in the background. And we'll see there's a, a bunch of different various ways that that happens as well. So why the heck are we doing this, right? Why are we going to all this trouble? Well, the whole point of this is to use these completion stages to avoid blocking user threads, the threads that are you know, user-facing, UI threads, and so on, until a result absolutely must be obtained. So we want these things to run in the background until we really, 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 really need to get the results. So the goal here is to avoid blocking. So as a consequence of this, when you're programming with completable futures, you should try to use these blocking calls like join or get very sparingly. You only want to use them when you absolutely need a result. And without loss of generality, typically servers may never need to call join. They can simply start these things running in the background and when the computations are done, they'll simply send a result back to the client. So join may never need to be called. And clients may need to call join occasionally, usually when they absolutely have to get a result to display to a user. So sometimes you, you know, when the result finally comes back, you join because you don't want the client to make any more progress until you get a result. So depending on your program, the goal is to be very careful not to use join or get very much. And if you do this, if you're consistent in this, if you think thoroughly and use completable futures correctly, you can make your design a lot more responsive because you're never blocking unnecessarily. You're only blocking if you absolutely have to get the results. And in many cases, you just let things run. And when they're done, you get the results back. So I like to think, when I think about completable futures, the metaphor that comes to my mind is juggling. And if you think about it, if, if you're a juggler, if, or you know someone who's a juggler, multitasker in some ways, you have a bunch of balls, and the goal is to keep as many balls in the air as possible. And you only grab the ball long enough to throw it up again. So it, it remains in your hand only long enough to make it be asynchronous. So you, you synchronously touch it long enough to transfer hands and throw it back up again. And that's the way to think about completable futures. You want things sort of up in the air, running in background threads, that is, as much as possible, and only blocking long enough to do something with a result, which should typically be very quick, and then initiate some asynchronous computation. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind as you think about the examples that we talked through. OK, so that's a quick overview of completion stage methods. And then, of course, we're going to look through the many, many different variants, because as you saw, there's quite a number of them.